I mentioned the April 6 movement in my introduction. It started as an Egyptian Facebook group in spring 2008 to support the workers in an industrial town who were planning to strike on April 6. Activists called on participants to wear black, stay home that day. Bloggers and citizen journalists used Facebook, Twitter, Flickr, blogs and other new media tools to report on the strike, alert their networks about police activity, organize legal protection and draw attention to their efforts. With me now is Yusuf Al-Baz of the April 6th movement. Yusuf, welcome to the uh, show. Uh, as I introduced the April 6th movement there, and it is one of the important components of this revolution, it sounded like a, a left-wing organization. Is that how you would describe yourself? What is the political orientation? Uh, we can see the association because obviously we started off as uh, not, 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 not the originators of this revolution, but as the vehicle to get the snowball effect to really consolidate support behind it. Um, and of course, the origins were a workers' movement in the city of Mahalla, where people were really struggling to live on uh, substandard government wages. Um, in terms of our sort of political orientation, um, political reform. It's a reformist agenda. Um, we, we are too young, too immature to, the, to, to sort of develop our own theology and sort of uh, our, our movement forward. Um, that has to be given time. We understand that. We're mature enough to understand that. So the first step is a reform. What other political forces are active in this seething mass of humanity? It's very difficult for us to get a handle on it here. We see the numbers, but we don't hear the speeches that are going on, in any case, with small megaphones down in the square. Give us a picture of this kaleidoscope of different political uh, ideological trends. Sure. Tr traditionally, Egypt has had, uh, 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 up till about the 50s, it had a robust... Uh, a sort of kaleidoscope, as you say, of, of movements from a socialist groups to communism and Marxism, or classic. Uh, I remember my grandfather was part of a Marxist uh, uh, movement or party. Um, and we hear some of those voices. And obviously there's the Muslim Brotherhood, which is a, uh, a social welfare organization for many years. And it hasn't manifested itself as a political party because it was never allowed to. So there are all these different components in society. Um, the idea that one will overcome the other uh, is... is is, is, is a scaremongering tactic. Yes. And what we're saying to commentators is actually Egyptians have proven so far that unity amongst those groups and voices uh, um, uh, you know, supersedes everything. Well, that's been an inspiration to the whole world. Uh, but of course, the world can be forgiven for looking forward from these dramatic events to what kind of Egypt is likely to emerge. What sort of new constitution are you and your fellow revolutionaries, I think we can call you, looking for in Egypt? Sure. Uh, it's, it, it, this, this one's a, an interesting one because we're not seeking to rewrite a constitution. We actually recognize that we have a, a, a relatively robust constitution that was uh, developed over many years and grown out of a, a former one as well. So. Having looked at that, you know, that, that almost establishes that the Constitution is, is a solid uh, piece of framework of governance. But what we're looking for is to retract the changes made under the 30-year emergency law by his regime, uh, specific articles that were uh, engineered to ensure the NDP, uh, the Democratic Party belonging to, to the Mubarak regime, basically settling in and having a solid stance uh, over the government for, for 30 years. So Unlimited term times, for example. Correct, correct. We Presumably you want a limit to the number of times absolutely. someone can be president. We, we want a limit. We want to include clauses for or fair representation within the parliament. Uh, we would want to include uh, um, in some definite concrete form assurances over uh, electoral methods and governance uh, at the grassroots level. So we have a number of discrete and definite items we want to change in the constitution. The irony is most of them are things that uh, the Mubarak regime added over the past 30 years. Uh, Mubarak goes we are looking not only for that, we are looking, as inspired by our Tunisian brothers, uh, a deep cleanse of the system. And we have to have a two-wave revolution. Uh, the first one got rid of the president. The second one cleansed the government. We shall do so. Well, that's, I think, uh, very encouraging to observers like myself because 
Sometimes a regime can throw sand in the eyes of, uh, of the people and claim to have changed when in fact all that's changed is the, the name uh, uh, above the, the door. Um, of the potential presidential figures, are we looking at the first democratic president of Egypt being one of the grand figures, like Amr Moussa, the Secretary General of the Arab League, or Mr. Al-Baradai, the Nobel laureate, uh, former head of IEA, or do you think the new, the next, the first democratic president will be someone whose name most of us don't even know yet? Sure. We, we, we've been under fire by the Mubarak regime being accused of being immature, but we are mature enough to recognize that um, we've given the energy and we can also, we have space and consensus, consensus to agree with a mature and seasoned approach. Um, would we be looking for a no-name figure? Um, not necessarily. We would welcome the experience and expertise of established names like Amr Musa. Um, Mohammed al baradai of course, a very well-respected figure. Um, uh, his popularity in Egypt, he has to consolidate that because obviously he's, he's been out of the country for many years. But uh, I, again, uh, we ask the people of Egypt to overlook these things because we've had people who have been in Egypt for 30 years and they haven't done anything. Yes, yes. So it, it's a bit it's of not mind. necessarily a Correct. clarification. But, yeah. but, our position is a healthy one, which is we're open. Uh, we've welcomed reformers like Hossam Badrawi into the parliament. Uh, Amr Musa is a great example. We have five or six names uh, established and non-established. Um, we are where we need to be, which is we have a choice. Mm. Well, uh, quite so. Now, uh, the Twitter revolution, tweeting, Facebooking, flickering, and all these other newfangled things, has this been oversold? Or did it play a significant role, at least in the beginning, of getting these street protests moving? Sure. Um, uh, it, it, an irony, uh, April 6th being a movement that started on Facebook, I, I'm not necessarily greatly computer uh, literate. But uh, if we look at the real heart and soul of the movement, um, uh, of course, there's Ahmed Meher, there is uh, Mohammed Adel, who is our PR uh, guru. And yes, he, he has used all these tools available to him to really galvanize and increase the scope of uh, the April 6th movement as well as colleagues in the, in the January 25th movement. The consensus is definitely there. Uh, again, I, I go back to um, uh, the lessons of history from our elders who took part in the 52 revolution um, and they worked with leaflets and word of mouth. Um, so those tools, mass and fast communication really did galvanize this revolution. But not to be confused with the real reasons, the source reasons is uh, do not condescend this or, or sort of brush this away as some sort of youth internet uh, fad. No, no, this is serious. This is about the people and it has real substantial origins. What about television? Uh, in his speech the other night, Suleiman denounced uh, foreign satellite uh, television stations. I'm sure he had uh, the likes of us and Al Jazeera and others uh, in mind. How much has that, you know, I, I, I have a difference, I think, with you in that I'm an admirer of the late President Nasser. Uh, President Nasser just had one microphone and one radio station. If he'd had Al Jazeera at his disposal, well, the Arabs might have been united uh, by now. How important has uh, the existence of pan-Arabic satellite television stations been? Sure, if, you, if uh, anyone flies over Cairo, it looks like a scene from a sci-fi film because you see the dishes dotted all over Cairo. Um, TV and satellite TV ch channels available in the street cafes and homes does have a wider level of infiltration, penetration throughout the masses than, say, uh, Internet. Uh, so independent satellite, small satellite stations that broadcast within the region have been key because a lot of them can be unregulated operate not necessarily within the Arabian region, so they've had free scope to say what they want. Um, I, I would say uh, as much as we, uh, we, we jump on the bandwagon of the internet being the champion, uh, TV is recognized, specifically the satellite, independent satellite TV channels. Uh, I think that's where we got the mass appeal. How do you think this is all going to develop now? Um, is there a perspective, it's a dreadful one, but that needs to be considered 
that the armed forces will in the end fight for and the remnants of the regime or in the face of such orders do you think that many most all of Egyptian soldiers would refuse to engage in mass murder of their own people sure uh, today we um, uh, and uh, throughout this this whole period uh, what we've said to people is uh, when you uh, walk through the streets, when you have your dinner, you sit down next to an army soldier, have dinner ne ne next to him, uh, pray next to them, uh, combine, become one with them, um, and ask them the question, look at them and ask them, will you shoot me? And um, we, we're pretty confident, the answer is no. The army uh, as, a, as, a, as, a, as an organization, as a mass of soldiers, is not our greatest concern. Um, what is our greatest concern as we approach a, a more distilled uh, set of events now uh, as we've gone through this uh, th this three-week process is the Republican Guard. The Republican Guard as opposed to the army are not made of conscripts uh, they're not low paid, they're usually well paid live in good standards of accommodation provided by uh, sort of the, the, uh, the, the president's Republican mm. or p almost a private army um, and they have a different set of motivations and drivers. These are the people we fear. When we look at the larger landscape of things, um, it's very regrettable and very sad that this whole situation, which is, you know, basically this revolution is to look after the welfare of the nation of Egypt and its people, has distilled into a battle of personalities. So we have a uh, docile patriarch minister of defense, Tantawi. We have a rather vigilant and robust and sharp-minded um, chief of staff who almost overwhelms the minister of defense. And then uh, that's Sa Sami Anan. And it's, it's now boiling down to a personality clash. We actually think the army headed by Tantawi would actually allow a natural course of events to happen as it did in eastern Germany, as it did in, uh, in, in other such revolutions. Uh, take a step back and let the people's will take, take place. But it's, it's Sami Inan and the Republican Guard, and it, it's, it's, it's very regrettable, and I don't think history will mark them down very well on that. Thank you very much, uh, Yusuf Al-Baz, from the April 6th uh, movement. We don't yet know how this revolution will play out, but one thing's for sure. Egypt, and indeed the Arab world, is never going to be the same again.